Uh, morning everyone, I am going to uh, go into my presentation, a particular place of a cohort study. So, going to a case scenario, a 52 year old gentleman, known case of rheumatoid arthritis, currently on biologicals for this treatment. His wife had been recently infected with herpes zoster infection and he comes to the medicine opening in fear of getting the infection as he is immunocompromised. So, he enquires if any vaccine can offer him protection against herpes zoster infection, what would you do? So, uh, going to this question, to answer this question, I have gone through literature and uh, found out a cohort study, it's a prospective cohort study in which they have looked at effectiveness of recombinant zoster vaccine against herpes zoster in the real world setting. Uh, I had used the JAMA critical appraise guidelines for uh, appraising this study. Going into the critical appraisal, uh, the PICOT statement, the population which they included was uh, vaccine safety data link members, age 50 years or older, who are eligible for recombinant zoster vaccination. So, this vaccine safety data link is a uh, health insurance uh, cohort of people which they have in US. So, uh, and incident or exposure which they have looked at is the recombinant varicella zoster vaccination, either single dose or double dose. And control was unvaccinated participants. And outcome which they have looked at was incident herpes zoster cases after the vaccination or in unvaccinated group of people. The timing of follow up, so they had followed up, they have started the study in 2018 and then continued to 2022, and the patients are still being followed up. So, the average follow up which they mentioned for vaccinated group of patients were 1.4 years and average follow up for unvaccinated patients were 3.2 years follow up. So, the setting as I mentioned was four vaccine safety data link sites in Northern California, Colorado, Northwest and Marshville Clinic and the study design was a prospective cohort study. So, uh, were the patients similar to the prognostic factors that are known to be associated with the outcome? So, they had actually not given a detailed table comparing the baseline characteristics of the patient in the exposed and unexposed group. The table which they have given is this table, the characteristics of the study population. So, in which they have taken into account of age of the patient's sex, uh, race and uh, live, sort of, uh, live uh, zoster vaccine status at the entry. So, if you look at, uh, look at the table, uh, most of the patients belong to the 50 to 54 years age group and uh, there were equal proportion of males and females, 46% males and 53% females. Most of the patients were whites, uh, which belonged to 59.1% and Asians belonged to only 13.8% of the people. And all these, uh, around 36% uh, of the people had received a uh, uh, live zoster vaccine at least 10, within 10 years before they enrolled into this trial. Uh, so, they had actually mentioned uh, later on that uh, they had used Cox regression models for uh, adjusting for all the confounders which they have looked at. So, various confounders which they have looked at are sex race, uh, sex race and ethnic group which are time fixed variates and other uh, things they have looked at were age, uh, the life status, corticosteroid use prior, influenza vaccination which they have received, hospital admission, outpatient frequency and five health conditions, diabetes, COPD, coronary artery disease, obesity and hypertension, which they have looked at. So, they have adjusted uh, both the groups based on these uh, parameters. However, few confounders or variants which were not considered, which I thought was the, risk the other risk factors for developing a herpes zoster, like underlying autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, IBD, use of DMARTs, use of biologicals or history of HIV infection in them or a previous history of physical trauma, which can all predispose to develop herpes zoster infection later in life. So, these things they have not looked at, but still they had mentioned this Cox regression which they have used at the end to adjust for all the factors which they have looked at. Uh, so, where the circumstances and methods for detecting the outcome similar? So, their uh, outcome was incident herpes zoster infection. So, that they have uh, defined based on ICD-10 revision def definition, which is based on clinical information and also along with the prescription of an antiviral within 7 days of diagnosis. So, if they uh, met this criteria, they have diagnosed them to have a herpes zoster infection. However, uh, they did not use PCR for diagnosis of cases which was actually used as a gold standard in the recent clin clinical trials assessing the efficacy of this recombinant zoster vaccine. So, uh, as they have not used PCR, so only patients would actually who were presented to the hospital would have been picked up. So, any mild cases which did not present, 
to the hospital would have been missed as a herpes zoster diagnosis and that they would not have considered in the outcomes. But they mentioned uh, the positive predictive value of this uh, definition diagnosis to have around 96 percentage. This is based on a recent chart review which said mentioned for this uh, method of diagnosis. Uh, so was the follow-up sufficient? Was, was it different in the two groups? People who had the vaccine and didn't have the vaccine, if they both had the same kind of method of detection, then you'll probably miss the same or wrongly diagnose the same amount. But the, was the vaccinated people having a different method of diagnosis and unvaccinated having different method? Same method was used. So the circumstances were similar. Okay. <laughs> So was the follow-up sufficiently complete? So they are actually not uh, given a stroke diagram for the study progression uh, in the article or the supplementary index. And uh, the, like Fern mentioned, there was no kaplan uh, mail curve also they had uh, put in the uh, supplemental index. So the duration of follow-up in individual patients was not specified and at what point in time they were lost to follow-up also was not clear. But they mentioned in the discussion part that they had a 27% loss to follow-up. With 7% of the patients had died and 20% were disenrolled from the study. How are the reasons for the same? Whether what is the reason for them to be disenrolled from the study? That was also not mentioned. However, they mentioned an average duration of follow-up for their uh, study participants. Unvaccinated person had 3.2 years average follow-up. And vaccinated person, if they had received one dose, they had 1.6 years average follow-up. And uh, people who had received both the doses had 1.4 years of around average follow-up, which they mentioned. So total study participants uh, which they enrolled were 19,96,885 and around 38 percentage of them had received at least one dose of vaccination and both doses around 29 percentage had received and patients who are still in follow-up are around 14,19,944 patients. So this includes both the vaccinated and the, and the unvaccinated persons. So going into the results. Uh, so, how strong is the association between the exposure and the outcome? So, they had calculated a hazard ratio for vaccinated and unvaccinated group of people. This they have calculated after uh, using that cost regression model. Later on, they had calculated the hazard ratio. And vaccine efficacy was calculated as 1 minus hazard ratio and was expressed in percentage. So, this is how they have used the cost regression and they have uh, mentioned different variables which they have uh, taken into account. So, uh, based on this, they had calculated uh, uh, for pay people who had actually had received both the doses of vaccination, uh, when they have adjusted for all the other variables, they had a hazard ratio of 0.24 uh, for uh, having an incident herpes zoster infection post vaccination. Uh, so they had looked at all the other things also. So going into the results uh, table, so uh, they had actually not mentioned the actual number of people, however, they had mentioned in person years. So, in the unvaccinated group of people, 42,798 incident herpes zoster cases were there when 64,19,704 persons were followed up for a year. With an, uh, they presented also an unadjusted rate before and later on they had used the cost regression and then they mentioned the adjusted vaccine efficacy. So, the incident rate which they mentioned is 6.7. Uh, when in comparing with the uh, people who are fully vaccinated after 30 days, they had an uh, event rate of 1.7. So, uh, as they not mentioned the actual time when the event had occurred, uh, with this I can't calculate the hazard ratio. So, I was able to calculate the relative risk. So, the relative risk was uh, 0.25. So, which would translate to a, at least 75% uh, efficacious vaccine. So, uh, people who are in the uh, double dose vaccinated arm would have 75% lesser incidence of herpes zoster cases if they had been vaccinated with both the doses and uh, when if you can look at the vaccine efficacy was significantly higher in the uh, vaccinated group compared to the partially vaccinated group also so uh, in the partially vaccinated group their uh, rate was 2.5 and in the fully vaccinated group was 1.7 which would translate to at least 64 percent efficacy in the single vaccinated group and 76 percent efficacy in the fully vaccinated group. Uh, so this is when these patients are followed up for uh, one or two or three years, they have divided and then they have calculated the vaccine efficacy. So when you look at this, uh, the maximum vaccine efficacy is actually in the group which uh, only have follow up after both the vaccine they have received. 
the incident rate was 1.5 and the vaccine efficacy was around 79 percentage. So when you actually look at uh, people who had received only one uh, dose of vaccine, uh, they had maximum vaccine efficacy also within one year of the first dose, uh, which is the incident rate of 2.1 with the vaccine efficacy of 70 percentage. But if you had followed up these patients over the next three years, you can actually see the vaccine efficacy, uh, the incident rate is increasing, like from 2.1 incident rate went up to 3.9 the next year, then it's 3.6 and 3.3. So there's a jump from the initial uh, incident rate, which translates to a decrease in vaccine efficacy from 70% to 45%. When you actually look at the people who had actually had both the doses, the initial incident rate was 1.5. There was a slightly increase in uh, incident rate, but later on it was stabilizing here. Uh, so initial efficacy was 79%, which came down to slightly 75% and later on it was stabilizing. So patients in the uh, both, uh, pa if patients have been vaccinated with both the dose of vaccine, they were actually having a stable uh, risk later on compared to patients who only had a single dose of vaccine which was administered. So uh, this would translate to having the both the dose of vaccine more efficacious than getting a single dose of vaccine. So when they did the subgroup analysis based on age, uh, uh, corticosteroid use prior to uh, the vaccination, uh, they had got the similar uh, results, like uh, the uh, vaccinated group still had a better vaccine efficacy compared to the unvaccinated group. So how precise is the estimate of risk or benefit? So uh, the, as I had mentioned, the vaccine efficacy was uh, calculated to be 76 percentage for uh, both uh, doses vaccinated people with the confidence interval of 75 to 78. So it can go as low as 75 or as high as 78. So the confidence interval was narrow and the result is precise. So how can I apply the results to the, my patient care? Uh, so where the patient similar to patients in my practice. So uh, as I mentioned before, most of the patients in the study population were whites, 59.1 percentage were whites. Asians belong to 13.8 percentage. So any unknown characters of the population which if it had affected the outcomes would have been gone unnoticed. That is one thing which I thought. Another thing was at least 36 percent of the patients have been previously vaccinated with the live zoster vaccine before they enrolled into the trial. So that would have also affected the uh, results actually. So whether the zoster live vaccine had a better uh, effect and then had offered greater protection to the people in US like they are considered. When you come to the Indian population, the vaccine uh, administration rates for herpes zoster is extremely less. So whether that would translate to a much lesser effect if you had taken it from Indian population is another thing which I thought. However, the proportion of herpes zoster infection seen in Indian adults is also mainly more seen in more than 15 years age group, according to the studies which are done in India. So was the follow-up sufficiently long? Uh, so they had mentioned a 27% loss to follow-up, which was significantly high and would have affected the outcomes. Uh, and also at what period of the study period they were lost to follow-up also was not specified. And also the reasons also. However, uh, considering they had followed up patients who had vaccinated also for at least 1.6 to 1.4 years, I thought it was probably sufficient to look for a vaccine effectiveness. For that one to two year period, the vaccine was effective, they were able to mention. So is the exposure similar to what might occur in my patient? So uh, the recombinant zoster vaccine is actually approved for use in India uh, and was launched by GSK in April 2023, which is sold by, under the name Shingrix. Uh, so the, uh, but like for implementing the vaccine, the need for proper storage, cold chain for transportation, might not be as effective in India as it is there in other countries like the USA which they had. And all the patients which were enrolled in the previous trial had a health insurance coverage. So that is also different uh, in India compared to US. So uh, if we need to implement such uh, program uh, like whether they have to implement such a vaccine in India, they need more awareness and targeted immunization programs as well as patients need to pay for all these uh, vaccines and that has to be more made more aware to the patients also. Uh, so currently the Indian recommendation API and CDC uh, for more than 15 years, 50 years, one or two doses based on the type of vaccine they recommend and also Indian Society of Nephrology recommends 
uh, more than 16 years age group people to have at least one dose of herpes zoster vaccine. And what is the magnitude of the risk bar effect? So uh, when you look at the absolute risk reduction, uh, in the unvaccinated group, the event rate was 6.7 and the vaccinated, fully vaccinated group, the event rate was 1.7. So absolute risk reduction is 5. So the number needed to treat uh, was 20. So every 20 uh, people who are treated with the herpes zoster vaccine, a uh, herpes zoster event can be prevented. So that is the uh, magnitude of effect which is coming. And uh, are there any risk that offset the benefit associated with the exposure? So even the adverse vaccine reactions are also not reported in the current article on supplementary index, which is a major drawback. Because for a vaccine which is newly introduced, we would like to be uh, aware of what all uh, adverse reactions and uh, uh, complications which might arise, which they had not mentioned. And however, the reported loss to follow up was also was 27%, including 7% death and 20% withdrawal. Whether the withdrawal from the study or the deaths were attributed to the vaccine was also not very clear. Uh, that was also not mentioned anywhere in the study. Uh, so coming to my case scenario, uh, so they had mentioned the vaccine efficacy close to 75%. So considering given such a high benefit, I would actually recommend the vaccine to the current person and can actually be considered on a case-to-case -case ba uh, basis. However, they had not mentioned the areas of the vaccine, uh, which and I will be cautious to watch for any adverse events in my patient if I recommend. Uh, However, if we think of implementing this as a public health implementation in immunization programs, we would need more further studies in the Indian population. And also the comparison of cost of vaccine implementation versus the cost of treatment of the herpes zoster cases. So the cost of two doses of the recombinant zoster vaccine, uh, the single dose is 10,999. This is the cost in CMC, but right now we have only one uh, dose of vaccine which is stock here in CMC. So for two doses, it would come up to 21,998. So for 20 people, which is the number needed to pre treat to prevent one zoster infection, it would come up to 4,39,960. This is just for the cost of the vaccine alone. Uh, so for treatment of herpes zoster, if you look at, if they have a localized dermatomal zoster, the treatment is oral acyclovir 850 five times daily for seven to 10 days. So the total cost for that for 10 days would come up to 1,470. This is the, uh, cost needed for a single day of uh, acyclovir and if they are disseminated softer we need IV acyclovir 10 mg per kg Q8 early for 10 to 14 days which would come up to 63,000 so the cost of treatment is uh, lesser however this does not take into account the hospitalization cost and other charges but if you look at just the uh, medicine cost this is significantly lower compared to what uh, implementation of vaccination would come up to. So that need to be looked into late, later in detail before implementing such a vaccination program. Thank you. Let's give him a hand.